It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the AOC Q27G3XMN. As usual for a video review, what you see depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software, and by YouTube, and ultimately, and very importantly, it depends on the screen that you're viewing the video on, so it doesn't accurately represent what you'd see firsthand using the monitor. In the description of the video you'll find supporting articles and videos, and also information about how you can support the work that we do. Be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, they are nice ways of showing your support. So the version of the monitor I'm looking at is the European version, known as the Q27G3XMN slash BK. The BK actually just means that it has a black stand base, rather than a dark grey stand base. But the performance characteristics are very similar. There are a few slight differences, which I'll cover in the review at relevant points, because they use slightly different firmware, but the vast majority of what I cover in this review applies equally to both models. So the monitor has a native 2560 by 1440, that's QHD, or 1440p resolution, and it uses a VA panel. The monitor also has a so-called mini LED backlight with 336 dimming zones, whether this should be called mini LED is debatable, but either way it is FALD, full array local dimming, and this certainly does enhance the experience in various ways as explored in this review. So the QHD resolution spread out across a 27 inch screen, you get a good pixel density, decent level of desktop real estate, decent level of clarity to text and suitably high resolution image content, that would include games as well. So many people do find this a practical and versatile resolution and screen size combination. So just going to quickly look at the refresh rates supported by this monitor and a few associated things here. So you can run 180 Hz, 2560 by 1440 with 10 bits per channel if you wish. You can use HDR as well at the same time and VRR. We have to be using DisplayPort 1.4 for all of that. By HDMI you're limited to a maximum 144 Hz. You can see that 120 Hz is also a listed refresh rate and you're limited to 8 bits per channel. If you want to use 10 bits per channel or even 12 bits per channel, then you'd have to be running at 60 Hz via HDMI. Be aware that there's no specific advantage to selecting 12 bits per channel unless you're using very specific software that happens to take advantage of this. Final thing to note, if you're using HDMI, there's also a 4K UHD downsampling setting that runs it up to 60 Hz. So that's useful for games consoles in particular. It means the monitor will accept a 4K UHD signal. The monitor also provides an interpolation scaling process which works up to 120 Hz for the full HD resolution, that's 1920 by 1080 And this provides moderate softness compared to a native full HD screen of this size. And unfortunately there's no sharpness control on the monitor to help counteract this. Some of the HDR settings, and that's whether you're actually running the monitor under HDR or if you're using a so-called HDR emulation setting under SDR, they will include an aggressive sharpness filter, but that really pushes things too far the other way. So the monitor doesn't really handle non-native resolutions very well, and GPU scaling as a PC user actually provides a slightly sharper look, though either way a sharpness control would have been welcome on the monitor for non-native resolutions. It's also worth exploring something I like to call static interlace patterns. So that's whereby some shades are broken up into faint horizontal lines of a slightly darker and lighter shade variant. Some greys, blues and oranges tend to show it most clearly. I'd say mainly blue shades actually in this case. So this image I'm showing you on the screen here, it just shows the difference in this little blue wallpaper at 60 hertz and 180 hertz. So at 60 hertz you can kind of see a distinctive grid-like pattern, that's just the sub-pixels, that's normal. You don't see that to the eye, this is obviously massively magnified. However, at 180 Hz, you can actually see alternating horizontal bands of a darker and lighter blue, which isn't there at 60 Hz. And those alternating horizontal bands, they are the static interlace pattern. And you can notice that to the eye. It is, of course, not as obvious as it would be in this image, but sensitive users, they can notice this. So it's easier to notice, but still not too obvious at high refresh rates such as 180 Hz. But it's not something which most users will find bothersome or necessarily notice at all. Things appear well blended, so the lines are very faint by 144 Hz, and essentially invisible into the double digits. So if you're really finding it bothersome, it's mainly on the desktop you might notice it, although you can notice it elsewhere as well, potentially. And you could consider lowering the refresh rate of the display, but really I think most people are going to be quite happy using this 180 hertz and aren't going to find this too bothersome anyway. I'm now going to cover the external features of the monitor. So you can see it's mainly matte black plastic. It has these little lines, if you like, each side of the bottom bezel. They're a 
dark red metallic effect plastic. They're not bright red as they may appear in some photos and videos of the monitor. The same material is used for the cable tidy in the middle, which you don't always see from the front. It just depends on the stand height and your relative position. Note that this is the BK model, so it has a black stand base. That's actually what the BK stands for, black for the stand base, whereas the non-BK model has a dark silver stand base. The screen surface is what I would classify as light to very light matte anti-glare. So that means you can sometimes see some sharper glare patches. It gives a bit of a glassy look to the screen in brighter light. As you can see now, that's actually bright, direct, natural light striking the screen surface there, which is why you can see that. Generally, the glare handling is pretty good, though, in most normal lighting conditions. I wouldn't usually suggest you have strong, bright, direct light striking the screen surface like that, but it just means it doesn't diffuse direct light as much as some matte screen surfaces, which is good in the sense that it doesn't haze the image up as much, nor does it give you these sort of glassy reflections with weaker light sources or just in a generally somewhat bright room to the same extent that you might get with a glossy screen surface or perhaps an even lighter matte anti-glare screen surface than this one. At the rear of the monitor you can see the black and red theme continued. It's again a dark red metallic effect plastic used for the red elements. This stand here is also fully ergonomically flexible, meaning you can tilt the monitor, you can swivel it left and right, you can adjust the height by 130 millimeters or 5.12 inches, and you can pivot it into portrait. If you detach the stand using the quick release mechanism, it reveals provision for 100 by 100 millimeter visa mounting. In terms of the overall build quality, I'd say it's pretty decent given the price of the monitor. It doesn't wobble a huge amount. It does wobble a little bit though, and if you're using the OSD controls, which are towards the right side when you're viewing the monitor from the front, there's a little bit of shake, but it doesn't feel like super cheap plastic or anything. It's reasonably solid, or certainly not what I'd describe as a premium build quality. The ports face downwards, AC power input, so there's an internal power converter rather than having an external power brick. You've got two HDMI 2.0 ports, you've got DisplayPort 1.4, and you've got a 3.5mm headphone jack. There are no integrated speakers on this monitor. There is a little K slot, Kensington lock slot, just there. Turning attention now to the subpixel layout, this monitor has a regular RGB, red, green, blue stripe subpixel layout. So I have no concerns with text clarity. You may wish to run through the clear type wizard just to adjust according to your own preferences. Some VA models, it used to be a thing really more with older VA models. They sometimes had split subpixels or partial subpixel illumination, which meant that half of each subpixel might be used to show text or other fine edges. And this affected text clarity it could give a jagged look to some text and other fine edges, or sometimes a softer look. But this one doesn't have any of that going on. Focusing now on the calibration, this table at the top here that shows various different conditions that the monitor was tested under, and there are gamma and white point readings taken using a Data Color Spider X Elite color emitter. So you can see here, on all conditions tested, average gamma was 2.3, so not too far off the 2.2 target, and really for the purposes of this monitor, and the fact it does use a VA panel which has some shifts in gamma, which I will explore a bit later on, I don't think that you should really be overly concerned by this gamma performance, perfectly decent. The white point by default was a bit on the warm side, so 6144K, although the green channel was quite well balanced. You'll see with low blue mode reading, I like to include that just because I like to illustrate the kind of white point you can expect with the strongest low blue light setting that the monitor provides. So 4627K, so that's significantly warmer, much weaker blue channel, which is what you'd expect from a low blue light setting of this type. But I also had in brackets green push, that's because a relatively strong green channel is maintained. So that does give a sort of yellowish green tint to the image. Your eyes do adjust to that to some extent in time, but not fully. And I personally prefer my low blue light settings to have a warmer look without that green tint, so a bit of a reduced green channel. But of course there are various alternatives, including Windows Night Light, that works pretty effectively and it's quite customizable as well, which will give you an amber look without the green tint if that's what you're interested in. There are also a few color gamut settings, sRGB and DCI-P3. On the BK model, which I've tested, these had no effect whatsoever, did absolutely nothing. But as I understand it, the non-BK model does actually have a functioning sRGB emulation mode. So there was a bit of a firmware issue and this monitor does not have user upgradable firmware, so I'm not expecting this to change with the BK model, unless AOC decides to do some sort of hardware revision for newer units, which is possible. So really it's best to work on the assumption that only the non-BK model has a functioning sRGB emulation mode. 
The second table there, that shows what I used for my test settings, so how I set the monitor up for most of the review. This is also explored in the best settings video, which is part of the OSD video. And just a final note there, I do include some ICC profiles in the description of the video, or at least an ICC profile in this case, created using my test settings. But just for reference, they're not used in this review, but you may want to use them. You may find them useful, for example, to give gamut mapping information for color aware applications and that kind of thing. So to look at the gamma tracking in a little bit more detail, the top graph shows my test setting, which is very similar to the factory defaults using the gamma one setting. So there's a little bit of variation, mainly for some mid tones, but it doesn't really stray too far from the 2.2 curve overall. And actually for the dark shades and the brightest shades, it was pretty close to 2.2. And as I said earlier, this isn't something I'd be overly concerned about. There's also a gamma 2 and gamma 3 setting. So gamma 2 gives a lower average gamma, 2.1 average, and gamma 3 gives a much higher average gamma, 2.6 average. So if you want to lift up visibility a little bit and just have a lighter look to quite a few shades, then try gamma 2. If you want a deeper look to many shades, try gamma 3. Personal preferences, but I would recommend gamma 1. Moving on now to the brightness and contrast performance of the monitor. This table here, I know it looks quite busy, there's a lot of data on it. Just focus for now on the stuff with the white background at the start, so not the stuff with the grey background. That's with local dimming active and I will explore that shortly. So the monitor reached up to 566 nits and down to 69 nits, so that's a good brightness adjustment range. Although the dimmest it goes there isn't quite as dim as some sensitive users might like. Based on readings I've seen from other reviews, it's possible that the non-BK model, the brightness can go a little bit lower than this, maybe 40 to 60 nits. But it's difficult to say, it could be a bit of inter-unit variation as well. Either way though, most people would set their monitor between 100 and 200 nits, and this monitor very comfortably satisfies that, with a lot of headroom beyond that, and a bit of room below that as well. I've included the sRGB and DCI-P3 settings there just for reference, but as I noted earlier, they don't actually do anything on the BK model, which I'm testing here. And in terms of the contrast, I recorded a maximum without local dimming of 4,600 to 1, which is very good. That's firmly within VA-only territory without any local dimming active. You'll see that some of the readings there have less than and more than symbols. The reason for that is that some of these black luminance levels are very low, and the precision of the colorimeter, it just isn't high enough to give a precise reading. So for example, there'll be a huge difference in measured contrast if you compare 0 0.02 to 0 0.01 nits, though in practice, it may be really somewhere between those values. You just don't know exactly where between them. And right at the bottom there, you can see the results under my test settings where I recorded 4,250 to one. So a really nice contrast ratio still. There were some adjustments to color channels which may have reduced the contrast just a little bit. So you can focus now on the stuff with the shadowy gray background. That is with local dimming active. There are three different settings for local dimming, low, medium, and strong. But you can see that with this setting active, the contrast is enhanced. The way that the contrast readings are taken here, you've got a white square in the middle of the screen, and most of the time that is covering 4% of the screen, so 4% of the pixels are white, and the rest of the screen is black. There are some 100% white readings as well, that means the entire screen is showing white, and therefore the black luminance can't be measured. So in terms of the black luminance measurements, when it is possible, they're taken with the colorimeter offset to the right of that white patch, equidistant between the edge of the patch and the monitor bezel. So really just the black space to the right of the white square. Again, there are lots of less than and greater than symbols used here because of the lack of precision. But even so, with the medium and strong local dimming settings, you're really getting greater than 41,600 to 1 for the contrast ratio, which is a huge improvement compared to with the setting disabled. And if you just focus on the black depth, you'll see that, that I generally recorded similar values with all the settings, except that the low setting, I recorded less than 0.02 rather than less than 0.01, which is actually a massive difference. And that was recordable with the colorimeter and also visible by eye when you were looking at that black. And that's why the low setting gets a much lower contrast there. But certainly recordable, at least with the brightness set to 100% with local dimming active. Just a quick additional note, the monitor uses DC dimming rather than PWM, so the monitor can be considered flicker-free as advertised. Highly sensitive users should note that the backlight uses low amplitude oscillation at a very high frequency. So that means that the backlight isn't quite as stable as it could be but it doesn't exhibit the more distinct brightness fluctuations of PWM. So for the majority of users, even those sensitive to PWM, it shouldn't be problematic. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what you can expect using the setting in the real world. So I'm on the desktop here, 
And just as a general note, I don't really like using local dimming on the desktop. That isn't specific to this model. It's a more general point. So you've got 336 dimming zones and 3.7 million pixels or so on this monitor. So there's a clear mismatch and a lack of precision. Now for more dynamic content, such as movies and games, which I'll come on to shortly, the setting, the local dimming setting certainly is useful and the limitations can be less noticeable. But when you're on the desktop, there are some situations where you really can notice the fact you've got a relatively limited number of dimming zones versus the pixel count of the monitor. So often you'll be observing large areas of static shade and intersecting contrasting elements, which highlight this mismatch very clearly. There are various web pages you could be looking at, applications you could be running which would highlight it. But I'm just going to use X, formerly Twitter, to help demonstrate some of the issues you might come across. So the settings disabled at the moment. I'm just going to switch over to the low setting. Now I'm not sure how that looked in the video, but to my eye, there was a clear reduction in the brightness for the brighter elements, especially the brighter elements surrounded by darker content. So all of the white text here actually looks sort of dirty and greyish now whereas it looked sort of more of a pure white before. The depth of the very dark content, the black here, it is improved, just as I was showing you with the table earlier. But the low setting, again, kind of this was shown in the table, but it's really easier to notice with actual content. It doesn't give you the same boost in contrast as the stronger settings do. So basically it keeps the darker and brighter elements closer together in terms of their luminance values. But again, it's still heavily dragging down these brighter shades where they're surrounded by darker content. Switching over to medium, so the difference probably is really subtle and difficult to see in the video, but to the eye, the white there is a bit brighter with the medium setting just around this image, and the black is also deeper, so there's just more contrast. With the strong setting, the brighter content in general is just brightened up a little bit, especially for the large areas of bright content such as on this image here. So because it gives the greatest edge in contrast, strong is actually my preference. The dimming solution is also reactive enough to prevent obvious blooming trails behind moving objects which would occur if the zones dim too slowly and remain too bright, even when the bright object has moved elsewhere on the screen. This is demonstrated well with this local dimming test. There's a link to this in the description of the video. I'm not saying it's instantaneous in its reactions, but I'd say it's suitable given the reactivity of the monitor or slight lack of it really for these high contrast situations. And certainly for more closely matching shades, really there are no specific reactivity issues at all with the dimming zones. And that applies regardless of the size of the object or the movements. The local dimming solution does keep up well. But the brightness is adjustable using this setting. However, it isn't remembered separately for this setting active versus not active. So my preferred setting was 25 with the setting deactivated, but brighter shades will often be dragged down because of how the local dimming works. And I'll talk a bit more about this in game, but just Using this desktop example again, let's say I wanted this text to look more like it did with the local dimming setting off and at 25% brightness, I'd really have to start increasing it massively. So that text looks more as I'd expect it to, but then I look at elements like the address bar there and the white of the image there, and it's just uncomfortably bright in my opinion for regular desktop usage. And really where bright shades dominate, things are going to be quite overwhelmingly bright now. And just to give you another example of how things can be a bit annoying on the desktop, I've got Twitter with its sort of medium background and I can now see a bright halo around the mouse cursor. And there's just a general inconsistency with the grey background. So surrounding any of the brighter content, there's a sort of, again, that halo. So around the text there and certainly around the address bar, or near the address bar. So there's just this general inconsistency which isn't nice and you'll just generally find that things are brighter than they should be sometimes, sometimes things are dimmer than they should be and for me this isn't really an acceptable compromise on the desktop for any benefit you might get. And when I say on the desktop I really do mean with these sort of flat elements, browsing the internet, doing work, that kind of thing. For more dynamic content such as watching videos or playing games then things are very different. I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and for now I have local dimming disabled. So the contrast edge that the VA panel has versus your typical IPS panel or your TN panel, it is evident when you just look at the darker shades here, more depth to the shadows there, for example, and even a lot of these medium shades, they just have an inkier look to them. So remember, under my test settings, I got over 4,000 to 1 for my static contrast, so it's roughly four times as high as you'd get on your typical IPS model. And certainly that does make a difference, especially if you're in a dimmer environment as I am here. 
It's not so obvious in this particular scene, but if there's a lot more darkness on the screen, you would typically see obvious blooms of IPS glow on an IPS panel. So that's emanating from the corners of the screen. It lightens things up a lot. On this model, there is what you might call VA glow, but it's much more subtle and it doesn't extend as far up the screen as IPS glow. There's just a sort of little bit of a purplish haze towards the bottom of the screen and the edges of the screen, which isn't present in more central regions, but it certainly doesn't affect the atmosphere as much as IPS glow does. There is an issue with VA models like this called Black Crush. So I can see that the shadow detail there isn't as good in the central region of the screen as it could be. It's easy to see those little details further out. And actually the perceived gamma is a little bit low for those dark shades when they're displayed towards the edge of the screen versus centrally. But actually it's about as low as I've seen on a VA model level of Black Crush here. I sometimes show you a little thing on the desktop to help demonstrate Black Crush on VA models. It isn't really something I'd obsess over too much. I've brightened the room up a bit so there's some natural light coming in now. And in these kind of conditions, it really does take the edge off the so-called VA glow. You can't really appreciate the depth of some of the darker shades in the same way. And that's because there's a little bit of diffused glare across the screen because there's brighter ambient light now. That does happen with matte anti-glare screen surfaces. But of course, there are no reflections to worry about or anything like that. So you might get on glossy screen surfaces, which I know are a real rarity in the monitor market these days just to help demonstrate the difference that the room lighting has on your experience. And in these kind of conditions, the difference between the VA model and the IPS model, they're more subtle. Back to the gloominess now. Observing these brighter shades, I can see what I describe as a light misty graininess from the screen surface. As I said, I'd consider it to be a light to very light matte anti-glare screen surface. It's actually a bit lighter than I've seen on quite a few VA models recently. So there isn't a lot of layering in front of the image. There isn't sort of a smeary graininess or a heavy graininess either. And actually 27 inch QHD VA models, quite a few of the ones I've looked at in the past, I have noted that the graininess was stronger than I'd like. And in this case, the screen surface is really more agreeable. Yes, I do still notice a little bit of graininess and layering and all of that, but I'm very sensitive to this. And for most people, this screen surface is gonna be very agreeable. I'm now going to talk about the local dimming setting using some in-game examples. So I'm just going to use this scene here just to talk about it. As soon as I switch to low, you might notice that everything just in general is a lot deeper, except for where that fire is blasting out there. That's really nice and bright. There's actually quite a bit of crushing of detail as well. So some of these darker shades are too dark. I've switched over to my preferred strong setting. So this actually deepens some of these darker shades even more, but there's a massive edge in contrast compared to with the setting disabled. But in terms of that crushing of detail I mentioned before, it's not actually too bad, but what's happening is a lot of the medium shades are actually dragged down so they're darker than they should be. And they just aren't the same distinctions you should get. Now you can counteract that by increasing the brightness. Now things get very dynamic indeed. So the fire there looks very bright indeed. The depth is maintained nicely for the darker shades. The medium shades are lifted up as well. So in this scene, I'd say this actually works pretty well. This particular level, especially if you want a very dynamic experience. Again, that fire really is very bright. But if I'm on a scene like this, then things just really look kind of flooded and overly bright. A lot of the medium shades are too bright, the brighter shades are too bright. Things aren't like they are under HDR when you have, where you have superior tone mapping precision and you'd have better defined bright highlights. There just isn't that level of precision, so things just generally look flooded. Problem is though that the very bright shades now look a bit duller than I'd like. And there can also be a masking of detail where there are lots of dark shades. That isn't really the case in this scene. I'm not gonna go through too many scenes. Yeah, it's a bit more visible here actually. So again, there's a masking of detail with the dark shades here. I've increased the brightness all the way up to 100 and that does offset it to a degree, but, but actually some of these shades are still dragged down quite a bit. So if I turn the local dimming setting off, things are generally much brighter. Although the depth of those dark shades is far less impressive now. And actually the depth of some of the medium shades is overdone, much brighter than they should be. So I still prefer the representation in this particular scene with local dimming on. It's just, it's difficult to get the balance right because for brighter areas, 
where the bright shades really dominate, things become quite overwhelming. And again, you don't get that nice tone wrapping precision you get under HDR. So it's kind of difficult to find the balance for what kind of brightness setting you might want to use. So if I really consider a broad range of scenes, this is just my preference. I find a brightness of around 60, again, using my preferred local dimming strong setting if I'm using local dimming. I find this quite well balanced overall. So yeah, I mean, again, things aren't perfect. Some definite over brightening of the medium to bright shades and things can be overwhelming in scenes like this here where you've got lots of the bright shades. But in general, where there's more mixed content and there's plenty of darker content, I do quite like the balance here. And I do feel that just the overall look, the extra contrast is quite easy to notice. And you don't really notice the fact you've only got 300 or so dimming zones versus millions of pixels as you might on the desktop. But ideally you'd get the medium to bright shades here brighter, but it can't do that because there's a lot of darker shade here which it needs to show. And ideally the shadow detail would be darker than it's shown here, whereas the medium to dark leaf shades next to it would be a bit brighter, etc. You get the idea, but that really would require a far greater number of dimming zones. Ideally you'd have per pixel illumination like an OLED. And I'm not going to pretend that there's anything comparable to this monitor in the price range in OLED form. So there's really a pointless comparison. I still feel that the local dimming setting on this monitor, even under SDR, does bring something welcome to the experience when you're gaming and watching movies. I'm now on Legom, legom.nl, the website and the test for viewing angles. I like to use this just to talk about colour consistency and that's used to explain the difference in a perceived shade when it's displayed in the central region of the screen, for example, versus elsewhere on the screen, particularly peripherally or near the edges of the screen. So the Legom text, that would ideally appear a blended grey throughout the screen. Here it appears quite blended for the central mass of the screen and then it transitions to orange and then red further out. Some VA models which have particularly weak gamma consistency or colour consistency, they'll show a very tight cone where it's really blended in the centre of the screen and it will very quickly transition to a much more colourful look for this Legom text and that's just as an example to sort of exemplify the gamma and, and colour shifts which occur. But with this one it's more gentle, it's, it's a much broader cone and that's good, that means that the colour consistency is you know relatively strong for a VA panel. But again, not perfect. It's not blended throughout the screen and there are shifts which you wouldn't see on an IPS panel and certainly not on OLED. When I'm looking at this purple block, this always looks odd in the video, by the way. I don't really know why it does this. But anyway, to the eye, it is a pinkish purple throughout the screen, but there is a stronger pink tint towards the edges of the screen. And if you shift your eye even slightly, or I shift the camera, the sort of purple versus pink hue that shifts readily along with the eye or camera movement. With the red block, it appears a fairly rich red in the center of the screen, actually for most of the screen, but towards the edges, it does look more of a faded red. And again, there's a shift between the two if you move your eyes. The green block, that's fairly consistent, a fairly consistent green chartreuse throughout the screen. Quite a vibrant shade, this one. It does look a little bit lighter towards the edges of the screen, but that's more to do with the dual stage panel border than anything related to viewing angles. The blue block appears a quite bright royal blue throughout the screen. As a VA model, there is DSE, dirty screen effect, to be aware of, something which VA models are quite prone to. And that means that certain usually dark to medium grey shades, that can be flat shades of other colours as well, can sometimes show it, but really certain shades can show this effect where there can be striations or sort of a splotchy look to things. Now this sort of dirty look you can see in the video here, that's not as obvious at all to the eye. You look at the horizontal bands and some splotches elsewhere and so also some sort of lighter vertical bands in places. These kind of, this kind of rough, non-solid appearance to the shade, that is something which I can observe by eye. But this is not bad for a VA model at all, this level of DSE, and it also isn't something which was widespread. There were very specific shades I had to observe which showed this, such as this one, which is an RGB value of 40 apiece. It's just something I like to mention for completeness. It isn't something which I think is going to bother you all the time, even if you're spending a lot of time on the desktop. I know you didn't come here to stare at blocks of solid colour. So I'm on Battlefield 2042 and I'm going to talk about colour using some in-game examples. So like most content under SDR, 
Things are designed with the sRGB color space in mind here. If you're using a gamut on the monitor, which is wider than sRGB, that invites extra vibrancy and saturation to some elements. So some things look more saturated than the developers or creators intend with sRGB in mind. So you can see the native gamut of this monitor on the screen. I actually recorded 95% DCI P3 and for those interested, 91% Adobe RGB. So there's a lot of extension beyond sRGB. So a lot of potential for extra vibrancy and saturation if you're using the native gamut. The greens here look quite vibrant and it's quite an extra punchiness to them. Not as extreme as I've seen on some models with an even more generous gamut, but certainly quite a bit of it. And again, the, the color consistency of the VA panel is decent, but there is more vibrancy for the central bulk of the screen versus if I'm looking at those same green shades right towards the edge of the screen. It's probably not obvious in the video. You might be able to see that there's just a sort of a richer look to the greens there versus there. Perhaps you can't see that so easily. It's a bit difficult to show you in the video. And there's also a richer reddish brown look to the earth here than there should be. It actually looks more accurate towards the edges of the screen where there's a bit of a loss of saturation versus the central bulk of the screen. But either way, I mean, the overall look is vibrant and yeah, the sky blues as well. They've got extra pop to them. And it's a look which some people are really gonna like. Other people, you know, you might want to tone things down a bit and there is an sRGB emulation setting on the non-BK model, whereas on the BK model, which I'm testing, that doesn't do anything as I explored earlier or explained earlier. But there are alternative sRGB emulation routes. So there's no video sRGB, which NVIDIA GPU users could use, for example. And if you use this, then it offers effective clamping of the gamut. Closer to sRGB, I recorded 96% sRGB coverage without very much over coverage to speak of. So I'm just going to apply this just to give you a little visual comparison. So it isn't applied at the moment and now it is applied. So the sky blues are toned down, those greens are toned down, earthy browns are toned down and when I talk about earthy browns it would also apply to some skin tones as well. They can look a bit overdone, a bit too reddish, a bit too rich, perhaps a little bit sun-kissed in places using the native gamut, whereas they're more toned down now with the sRGB setting. Although again, because of the color consistency, I'd say that things look a bit underdone actually towards the edges of the screen. So looking at the earthy brown here, it has a little bit of a clay-like look towards the extreme edges, but I've seen this to a much greater degree on some VA models. So this one, again, is really not too bad when it comes to the color consistency. Same with the greens as well, a little bit underdone towards the extreme edges of the screen. But in general, this is a decent sRGB representation. And as I understand from people who have got the non-BK model, the sRGB emulation setting of the monitor itself will give you similar kind of clamping behavior. So you can expect a similar kind of overall representation to things. Back to the unclamped native gamut now, just to talk a little bit about using this monitor for color accurate work. So. As I mentioned in the calibration section with a few tweaks, well, you know, you can get decent gamma handling. It's not perfect for the 2.2 curve, but there are shifts across the screen as a VA model anyway. I don't really think you should obsess too much about what a colorimeter is telling you right in the middle of the screen for panels like this. But of course, a pressing concern is going to be that gamut, which is much wider than sRGB. If you want to work within the sRGB space, then yeah, you've got the sRGB emulation mode of the monitor or alternative sRGB emulations in the case of the BK model, which you could also use with the non-BK model. But because of the color consistency issues with it being a VA panel, I don't generally recommend VA panels for color accurate work if that's really something you do a lot and you take really seriously. But it, you know, it's passable if you, if you have to use it for that kind of thing. And it's certainly gonna give you better results than a TN panel where they have huge shifts vertically. And if you want to be working in extended color spaces, well, there's 96% DCI-P3 coverage. So you've got decent potential there. I wouldn't say that 91% Adobe RGB coverage is really good enough for accurate work within that color space though. So overall, if color accurate work, color critical work is really something that you like to focus a lot on, I would consider an IPS alternative. But again, if you want to use it for a bit of that kind of thing at a hobbyist level on the side, then feel free. So far, I've focused on color consistency from a direct frontal viewing position, a normal viewing position in front of the screen. But what if you're viewing the screen off angle? Well, there's certainly quite a bit of washout as you get to sharper angles, even if you get just a little bit off angle, actually, there's quite a bit of a washed out look as if the gamma is super low and the perceived contrast is just much lower in general. Same if you're viewing it from above. I 
but you might be sitting back a bit from a sofa or bed or whatever it might be and from that position it actually doesn't wash out it actually deepens a bit so it's as if the perceived gamma is a bit higher so in other words this monitor you know it is usable if you happen to be using it a bit from below but from the sides or above you can expect a really nasty washed out image I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, running the game under HDR, and I'm going to talk about the HDR performance of the monitor. So this monitor is Display HDR 1000 certified, which is actually an incredibly high level for a budget monitor. A key part of this is the use of the 336 dimming zone FALD full array local dimming backlight solution, so-called mini LED backlight solution, and the ability of the monitor to pump out high brightness at the same time as some shades appearing much dimmer. So just focusing in on the brightness now, let's look at some numbers. So if you're not familiar, this test has a white square in the middle of the screen and it's surrounded by black. And that square has a patch size or a percentage window of 1%, which means it's covering 1% of the pixels of the screen, 4%, 9%, 25%, 49%, or 100%. 100% white means the entire screen is white and therefore there is no black surrounding it and therefore contrast can't be measured there. Some of the values here have a less than sign, some a greater than sign. The reason for that is again, like I mentioned in the full review when I was talking about contrast with SDR, it's because of the precision of the calibration instrument and there's a huge difference between 0.01 and 0.02 and there's rounding and all of that. So I'm just being a little bit careful, I'm not trying to pretend that some of these are exact or precise figures. But when you look at the brightness, you've got a peak brightness recorded of 1,374 nits, and that's for 100% white. For 1% white, that was the lowest reading, and that was 633 nits. The reason for that is because of dark biasing. So you've got 336 dimming zones, you've got white surrounded by black in this test. The monitor isn't just going to pump out that little white square, 1% white being the smallest white square used in this test, when it's surrounded by black. So it's actually going to dim that white, as you can see from these figures. But either way, this is an impressive performance, especially when you look at the 4% window size and above. And again, you can see the contrast advantage. So it's able to maintain less than 0.01 nits for the black, except for with a 25% window where it's less than 0.02. Then for 49% white, it was 0.06. So remember that the black reading is taken offset to the right, with the color limiter offset to the right of the white square, equidistant between the monitor bezel and the edge of the white square. So if you've got a 49% white square, that's a very large white square, really a relatively small black area to measure. So it's sort of close enough to that white that it's lifting the luminance up of the black a little bit, which is why it's 0.06. Anyway, don't want to obsess too much about these figures, just to show you that it is a very effective local dimming solution. It gives you a nice brightness level. I've given you a few at the bottom here, taken with the local dimming solution set to medium and low, just so you can compare with high. But as I showed you in the full review with respect to SDR, there's really more to this dimming solution than just looking at pure black and pure white. And these figures really only show part of the story. But even so, you can see that with the low setting, the contrast is simply lower than with the medium setting. And the medium setting is lower than with the high setting. And for this particular comparison, it's with a 4% white window. To give you a bit of context, I'm comparing here with a QD OLED, this is a typical QD OLED performance, the Dell Anima AW3423DW. And you can see that with the QD OLED, because it's got per pixel illumination, it doesn't have the issue with dark biasing for smaller bright elements, even if they're surrounded by pure black, it can show them with very high brightness. However, it has an ABL automatic brightness limiter, which means that when bright shades dominate, it dims. Whereas for the AOC, there's no such issue. It can very happily pump out very high brightnesses when bright shades dominate. It is worth being aware though. So the 100% brightness reading here, this is a sustained brightness reading. It was taken 30% after the shade was displayed. But actually the brightness of the display does decline over time under HDR in certain conditions. Specifically, if the monitor is displaying full screen white, which demands the maximum brightness for a few minutes, then the luminance can fall a bit to below a thousand nits. The brightness for smaller bright elements would also decrease temporarily. 
And this is to prevent overheating. The monitor's passively cooled, there's no fan, so the decrease in brightness is a countermeasure to stop it overheating, and it will increase again once the monitor cools down sufficiently. For example, if mixed content's presented for a while. I didn't observe this triggering when gaming under HDR, but if you're in a particularly warm room or you've been using HDR for a while, especially with a lot of bright dominant content, then it could potentially trigger. But it's not like the screen suddenly becomes dim when it does trigger, it's just that the brightest elements will be somewhat dimmer. So in terms of how things are set up under HDR, that is covered in the best settings video, but to give you a super quick reminder, you can't really control a lot under HDR, it might not be clear in the video, but pretty much everything's greyed out except for the HDR setting, but you really want to set that to display HDR, because anything else can inappropriately oversaturate the image, but it also has this, in my opinion, nasty looking sharpness filter. So when I'm looking at the foliage in the background, it looks really artificially oversharpened with anything other than the display HDR setting. And not to mention it looks completely oversaturated with most of the other HDR settings. Local dimming is the other setting of interest. I would just set this to strong. It's the most dynamic setting. You get the most out of the monitor that way. Set to medium. It's not dimming as well for the darkest shade. So there's an uplift there, which makes it look less impressive than it should really. A further uplift for low. And again, that's a bad thing for these particular shades. And as for off, well, things just look completely flooded and even the bright to medium shades look much brighter than they should and look quite sort of faded in a way. So yes, I definitely would recommend the strong setting. And the shadow details here, so they're not like you'd get on an OLED for this kind of scene where you'd get the shadows really deep, really dark, and the slightly lighter shades next to them would be just a little bit brighter but still really very deep. You just don't get that level of precision with 336 dimming zones. Having said that, the overall look to the scene, it's good. You know, I've just shown you what it looks like with local dimming off. And as it happens, I do have a little crosshair on the screen at the moment that's built into the monitor. I didn't actually mean to have that. I just accidentally pressed the button. I do that quite often on this monitor, actually. I find that a bit annoying. It's the third button along. If you press that when you're not in the main menu system, then it puts on this little crosshair. But it's useful in a way because it helps me highlight a little bit about haloing or blooming. You've got 336 dimming zones. For some situations, there is a bit of haloing. So I've got this bright crosshair and directly surrounding that dark shades. And it does lift the dark shades up a bit. Actually, a lot more subtle than you might expect if you just think of 336 dimming zones. Part of that is because of the panel itself has natively strong contrast as a VA panel with a good 4000 to 1 plus native contrast ratio. So that does help, and also the, the local dimming solution is really quite well tuned to not excessively bright bias when smaller bright elements are on the screen. So, for example, when I was showing you the readings for 1% white, that's why they were significantly dimmer than the peak that the monitor was capable of. A master monitor is able to maintain good depth for these darker to medium dark shades. The bright shades here, nice and bright, about as bright as I've seen this actually. It isn't the maximum of the monitor, the, the monitor's not trying to do that here, this is just natural daylight streaming in. And there's definitely excellent contrast between the darker shades and the brighter shades. Another advantage with HDR, you get excellent tone mapping precision, so you don't have to worry about the kind of imbalances I talked about under SDR when you were using local dimming, where some things are obviously over brightened and can look flooded, and darker shades can appear really kind of crushed together depending on the brightness setting you're using. You don't have to worry about the brightness setting, it's all set automatically. And actually the detail of the darker shades is improved compared to SDR. There's an enhanced nuanced shade variety, it can use 10-bit colour reproduction, so there's an excellent variety of closely matching dark shades. Again, per pixel illumination would improve this further, and if there wasn't any black crush at all, although as I said it wasn't an extreme issue on this model, there's a little bit of that going on. But I would say that really the overall detail levels for a mini LED solution, especially with this number of dimming zones, is actually pretty impressive. I think it's really quite well balanced overall. Jumping into the water now, as I love to do, there's a definite eye-catching look to the bright glint on the water there. I measured 854 nits for this shade, although it does depend how big the shade is. So that's really when it's bigger, when it blooms out, that's the reading. But it was actually sometimes below 500 nits when it was a bit smaller and that's really mainly because of the dark biasing going on because it's surrounded by shades which aren't super bright. The representation of these darker and the medium shades pretty good, good depth to them. 
It's able to show those brighter shades at the same time as the darker shades because of the local dimming solution, works well. Again, not supreme precision, so the depth of the very dark shades and, and some of the medium shades, it's not as good as it could be, it's not as good as it would be on an OLED, but it's still pretty good. Speaking of OLED, I know that's a bizarre comparison to make because this is a budget monitor, but even so, I do still like to talk about this scene with OLEDs. It is more impressive on OLEDs, it's more atmospheric in general, and there's just a greater variety of shade brightnesses. The limitation with the number of dimming zones is quite apparent in this kind of scene because there's sort of a, a pulling up of some of the little shadow details because of the somewhat brighter medium shades surrounding those little shadow details. And there just isn't the precision here with 336 dimming zones to present this properly. Although actually on some mini LED solutions I've seen they kind of go too far the other way and they start dark biasing really heavily even for scenes like this and that will crush the detail far too much and that can be really annoying actually. And certainly the look of the nice glint here, nice and bright, and again the surrounding shades, it's not the same contrast you can get on models with a much greater number of dimming zones, but it's still pretty good and it is vastly superior to what you would get on your typical LCD monitor under HDR, which might be a bit more like that. I've just turned the local dimming solution off. Things look really flooded and cloudy and nasty now. This is another scene where the precision of OLEDs is very good because there are some rather small bright elements interspersed with much darker surroundings. Sort of, the, you know, the atmosphere in general on this scene, it's not quite as good as it could be and I can see some halos around the bright elements. There's also a kind of shifting of the halos. It's kind of can sometimes look a little bit like a flickering effect, although it's not too strong in this case. If you're sensitive to that kind of thing, you might not find it too distracting here, but you can see it quite clearly. Um, you certainly see those little moving halos where there are fireworks in the sky, or there are little embers falling. You can see they have halos around them. But I'd say the shift in brightness of this versus the sky isn't as pronounced as I've seen on some IPS models with mini LED solutions where they're really aggressive and it really does look like an obvious flickering here. I wouldn't really describe it as an obvious flickering, but it's just something to be aware of if you're sensitive to that kind of thing. If you tone the local dimming down to medium and moreover to low, then the depth of those medium shades is brought up a lot. You can still see the halos, but there's less of a contrast between the sky, because it's brighter, or brighter than it should be, and the halo around the bright objects. So perhaps for some scenes you may prefer to lower the local dimming solution if you're particularly sensitive to flickering, but the overall atmosphere is much worse now, so I would just stick to strong if you can as I will be. And these halos as well, they would be stronger around the lights here in the background, for example, and the blue lights on the post there, for example. They should actually be brighter than they are, but there is some dark biasing going on. If it was bright biasing here, then the halos would be much more noticeable as well. So I think, it again, I really do think the balance that they've struck here with the number of dimming zones they've got is actually very good. I'm now on Battlefield 5, just for a little bit of variety, I'm running the game under HDR. Now this scene here is one that OLED monitors struggle with under HDR because there is a sufficient amount of bright shade that the ABL, Automatic Brightness Limiter, kicks in. But this monitor has no such issue, it is able to display the bright shades here very nicely. So the sun there, I measured 809 nits, so that is really impressive actually for this particular element. And there's just a generally nice bright look to the sky and the silver lining around the sky and the glint of light down there on the ice as well. Just the overall scene, it just has a nice natural daylight quality to it, which I think is really nice. So if you consider the peak brightness there of the sun, on an OLED you'd actually be lucky to see even half of that because of the ABL. So yes, I definitely do like the representation of this scene on this monitor. It isn't as, you know, as impressive as I've seen it on any monitor. The ASUS PG32UQX, that monitor is Display HDR1400 certified and it's able to pump out amazing peak luminance. And I didn't actually record this specific element with my colorimeter, but just by eye and how I remember this scene looking and 
just the observations I made. You know, it was even brighter than you can see here. But I do not look at the scene on this monitor and think it's lacking in brightness. And obviously there's a huge gulf in price difference between this monitor and that ASUS. I'm now going to focus on the other side of HDR, and that's colour reproduction. Back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So just as a reminder, this monitor's colour gamut, I recorded 95% of the DCI P3 colour space being covered, and there's a little bit of overextension for some green shades. So under HDR, the game developers can have wider colour gamuts in mind, such as DCI P3 and ultimately Rec 2020, a very large colour space. So it's different to SDR, where sRGB is the common target that developers have in mind, and if you're using a wider gamut than that on the monitor, then you just see oversaturation and extra vibrancy. So things are more toned down when you look at, for example, Lara's skin tone, and some of the overdone greens, some of the yellowish greens were far too strong under SDR. They're nicely toned down here, but they still look lush. They still look quite lush and, and vibrant, but you know, in a more appropriate way, and there's lots of good variety as well. As I explored under SDR, yes, there are some colour consistency issues, but relatively minor for a VA panel. So that is to say that there is some loss of saturation peripherally. So if I compare this rather vibrant red looking shade here in the centre of the screen and compare that to how it looks peripherally, there's a difference. Difficult to capture on the video, but I did show you various examples earlier in the full review. Similar kind of thing under HDR. But really the overall representation I feel is pretty vibrant and given the fairly generous colour gamut, the panel technology and the tuning which is done under HDR, I do feel that things are pretty vibrant overall. And again the local dimming solution just helps give an edge in depth to some of these medium to darker shades as well, which helps them look as they should rather than looking kind of washed out as they can be on a monitor with a much weaker number of dimming zones or no local dimming at all. So overall, I can confidently say with this monitor that it's by far the most engaging and dynamic HDR experience I've had on a budget monitor. It also gave me an excuse to finally play through the Modern Warfare 3 campaign, which I've been putting off for a while. You know, I've tested various OLED monitors as well, and they would have been really nice to use in, on that campaign. But I just wanted something a little bit different, and I decided this would be the monitor I'd use to play through the campaign. And I did really enjoy it overall. I think it really did justice to the HDR on that campaign. I'm back on Battlefield 5, and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. I've got the game running at a pretty solid 180 frames a second. This is a 180 hertz monitor, so I'm making the most out of the monitor in that respect. So I'm getting up to three times as much visual information as a 60 hertz monitor, or this monitor running at 60 hertz or 60 frames a second. And that brings with it a few key advantages. One is that it improves the connected feel, and that's the precision and the fluidity you feel when you're interacting with the game. That's also something which is aided by low input lag. In this case, I measured 3.48 milliseconds, and that indicates a low signal delay, which is the main element of input lag you feel. So that shouldn't be an issue even for sensitive users, the signal delay. So that, coupled with the 180 hertz refresh rate and 180 frames a second performance, does give a really nice fluid feel to things. The other advantage of this high frame rate, high refresh rate combination is that it greatly reduces the perceived blur due to eye movement. That is explored in an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness, if you're interested in more technical detail. But basically, perceived blur, it's mainly caused by your movement of your eyes as you track motion on the screen, and that's tightly linked to the refresh rate of the display, assuming a suitable frame rate is also being displayed. The other aspect of perceived blur to consider is pixel responses. A technique called Pursuit Photography is explored in that article I referenced as well, and that is a nice way of capturing both aspects of perceived blur. So here are some Pursuit photographs at 180 hertz. The monitor has very different overdrive settings, off, weak, medium, and strong. They're all shown here. The final column there shows a reference screen, the ViewSonic VX2728J-2K, also running at 180 hertz here. And that is a pretty fast IPS model. So you can see that regardless of the settings you use, you don't get that kind of good, solid IPS-like performance. There are some weaknesses, and they are most noticeable with overdrive set to off. So there's some trailing behind the UFOs, which has a bit of a smeary appearance, especially with the darker background, that's the top row. It's also there to a fair extent with the medium background, the middle row, much better performance with the light background, the bottom row. But if you increase the overdrive setting to weak, that does cut down on the trailing a bit. 
medium a little bit more. So when you're using the medium setting, you know, there is still a bit of a bold trail, but it's not too long, but it's not extreme. You can get a far more extended trail, much bolder and more and more extended trail on VA models than you can see here using the medium setting. The strong setting that does cut down on the trailing further, but it replaces quite a bit of it with overshoot. And to my eye, I found this overshoot too strong. I didn't like it, but some people might find it okay. So, you know, depending on the, really the games you play and your own sensitivity, you might find strong okay. But for me, I prefer the balance with the medium setting. I know some people prefer figures, some measured response times. These were measured using the OSRTT Pro tool. This is the same tool and the same methodology used by TFT Central. Just be aware that they use their own color coding system. So you can certainly see some red on the table here. This is using the off overdrive setting, a lot of red and some orange and just a little bit of green. The average initial time, that's the important one to look at here because these are the initial response times being measured at 6.1 milliseconds. So it's not very good for 180 Hertz really. Bumping up to weak, there's a bit of an improvement. It's a little bit more sort of golden green on the graph now. Average initial time boosted a bit to 5.64 milliseconds. Still some distinct weaknesses. The medium setting, well, that's quite a bit better actually. There's still some red for some of the high contrast transitions. So where you can see zero black as a starting point, it's quite a bit of red there. And also from white or very bright shades to sort of dark grays. Extreme example being 255 to 51 measured here, 10.3 milliseconds. So yeah, there are definitely some slow pixel transitions and those kind of transitions are the ones which would show that somewhat semi retrailing. But some VA models, you know, they'll be 20 milliseconds plus for these transitions. So this one isn't really too bad. The average initial times dropped to 4.61 milliseconds. And there is some overshoot recorded now. There's really very little of that to speak of at all using the weak setting and none with off. But even here, there's not really a lot. There's just sort of for an isolated transition and that's between white and a very bright shade. So actually to the eye, that doesn't create a super distinct overshoot trail or anything, but there is still some recorded. The strong setting, well, yes, that does improve the pixel responses. It's dropped from 4.61 milliseconds to 2.74 milliseconds for your average initial time. It's quite a bit of green on the graph. There's not really any red, although there's a little bit of deep orange, 8.4 millisecond max. But if you look at the overshoot, that has increased significantly. So that's really your trade-off here. So I'm using my preferred medium setting on the game. And yeah, you can see some perceived blur, some extra perceived blur in places, including for the mixtures for the brickwork there and the sort of dark to medium shade surrounding it. So there's just a general mask of extra perceived blur, but it's not extreme. And for this particular scene, there's nothing I'd really describe as obvious smeary trailing. There's a bit of what I might describe as heavy powdery trailing to the left of this when I move the mouse. So just the darker areas of the wall there with the much brighter sky in the background, or the medium to bright sky in the background. And also a little bit of that for the white text there and the white icon with the much darker background. But as far as VA models go, this isn't really particularly bad at all. And there's nothing in the way of obvious overshoot, which I can really point out here using the medium setting. I've just quickly switched over to the strong setting. I'm not sure if this will come across on the video, but I can straight away see some bright halo trailing that's brighter than the sky even there around the wall. I wouldn't say it's the most obnoxious and obvious overshoot I've seen, not on this scene. Still a bit eye-catching though. And even then there's a little bit of a extra mask of perceived blur in places, but it is reduced compared to the medium setting. So if you're gaming competitively, you might want to try the strong setting. You might find the overshoot tolerable, in which case you might prefer this setting. On another scene on Battlefield 5, and this one has a lot of high contrast transitions. So lots of very dark shades with much brighter background shades and that kind of thing. I'm still using the strong overdrive setting just for now because I just want to point out that there is some quite obvious overshoot around the light here. You can see this obvious dirty trailing. So it's just really what I like to call it because it's darker than the background. And that's just one example. So anyway, I'm going to switch over to my preferred medium setting. And that overshoot has gone. And really as shown with the measured pixel responses and test UFO. There's nothing really to complain about when it comes to overshoot now. There are some slower than optimal pixel transitions. And this scene here does show them off quite readily. So the makeshift roof there, actually there's a bit of this happening even with the strong setting, I should add. Bit of a smeary appearance, I suppose, to the trailing there. Also around the flag and the tree there. But some VA models have a more extended, sometimes it can even look smoke-like appearance to this kind of trailing. So there isn't that extent of black smearing here. 
but there is just a general mask again of extra perceived blur. Also, when I look at the bush here, during movement it does darken up a bit and it brightens up when the movement ceases. So it looks like it blends together during movement and it looks as it should when the movement ceases. That can give a kind of flickering effect with certain movements. It's not an extreme brightness shift. Some VA models do show this more readily than this one, but it is just something to be aware of. It can manifest also on the desktop, not just when you're gaming. So to show you another classic X or Twitter example, if you look at the grey text there, it blends in during movement and it becomes appropriately bright when the movement ceases. So again, it can look like a flickering effect with certain scrolling behaviour. That's with Firefox. I believe it's the defaults on Firefox, but the defaults on Chrome, that scrolls differently, sort of a larger section of the screen, and you don't actually see that kind of potential flickering effect or the darkening and brightening effect. But it depends on the browser and it also depends on the website you're on and certain animation patterns and things you'll be doing on the desktop will still show this kind of flickering effect. I'm not trying to scare you or anything. I think most people are going to find this fine and it's not as obnoxious as I've seen on some VA models. It's just something I like to raise awareness of. So really, as far as VA models go, the 180 hertz performance is pretty decent, but certainly there are imperfections. Monta also supports VRR via Adaptive Sync, so you can use AMD FreeSync with a compatible AMD GPU or games console, and you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode with a compatible NVIDIA GPU. I'm using an RTX 3090 at the moment, so I'm using NVIDIA G-Sync compatible. I've now got the game running at 120 frames a second. The monitor is running at 120 hertz. That's so using VRR, and that gets rid of tearing and stuttering from frame and refresh rate mismatches. The VRR range of this monitor is from 48 to 180 hertz. Well, that's the claimed range. The actual activation point does depend on the fluctuations occurring. And as usual, I found it was sometimes closer to 55 hertz or so that it seemed to be the floor of operation. But below this floor of operation, wherever it happens to occur, LFC, low frame rate compensation, can be used so the monitor can stick to a multiple of the frame rate with its refresh rate, which also keeps tearing and stuttering at bay. There is momentary stuttering when this boundary is crossed in either direction, and there are also some VRR flickering issues to be aware of, which I will come on to a little bit later, so just keep that in mind for now. But I just want to talk a little bit more about the 120Hz performance of this monitor, because that's of course relevant to certain games consoles. So I'm using my medium setting, my third medium setting, and the overshoot is increased a little bit, so I can see that around the light there, for example. And the weaknesses in terms of perceived blur, they're not as distinct, so the smeary trailing isn't as distinct now, although there's still a bit in places. You can look at all of this objectively. So first with some pursuit photographs, you can see a similar kind of relative performance when you compare off, weak, medium and strong, although the overshoot is really rather strong now using the strong setting. And again, the reference screen performs better than any setting on the AOC, but that's the difference in panel type. You're comparing a fast and rather well-tuned IPS panel to a you no know, decent VA panel. So let's look at some figures. Using the off setting, lots of red, 6.8 millisecond average initial time. This drops to 6.36 milliseconds using the weak setting, but still quite a bit of red. We can do better than that. The medium setting does do better than that. Shifts things more over to the orange and golden greens for the graph. A bit more green as well. The average initial time drops from 6.36 milliseconds to 4.63 milliseconds. So that's a significant improvement. But again, you know, there are some imperfections, even for 120 hertz, where the pixel response requirements aren't as strong as they are for 180 hertz. There's still some slower than optimal pixel transitions even here. And there's a bit of overshoot recorded as well. So they are actually for similar transitions to what I was showing you with the light there, where there's sort of dirty trail around the light. And you see that recorded in this graph for 255, which is white to 153 or 204, which are your medium to bright shades. Using the strong setting now, the average initial time has dropped from 4.63 milliseconds to 2.82 milliseconds. More green now, and there's no red recorded for the initial response times, but there's a lot of red for that overshoot. So the other thing to be aware of at 120 hertz is the 
perceived blur due to eye movement is worse now than it was at 180 hertz. So there's a general increase of perceived blur for that reason, and the connected feel isn't as good either. But in both respects, 120 hertz is still decent refresh rates, especially when you compare to 60 hertz, 60 frames a second experience, which I'm now showing you. So with this, there's a further increase in overshoot. My classic example here is very obvious now. It persists for longer, the overshoot, so it's more eye-catching. You might want to tone it down to weak. You might find that a better balance. But let's just dive into some objective measurements now. So with the Pursuit photographs, so you now see using the medium setting, there's a bit of overshoot introduced. You can see that, for example, for the medium background. But I would say in-game there are some more obvious examples of this. So you might find, depending on the scene you're viewing, that the medium setting is fine to use, even at 60 hertz. But personally, I think weak is better balanced here. And again, the VX2728J-2K. This performs very nicely at 60 hertz. So let's look at the figures at 60 hertz using the off setting. Average initial time, 8.12 milliseconds. Using the weak setting now, that's reduced from 8.12 to 7.94 milliseconds. And there's quite a lot of red on the graph now. But for the 60 hertz refresh rate, your pixel response requirements are much lower for a decent experience, so you might find this actually fine. Now for the medium setting, I've got two things here. One is for static and one is for VRR. I didn't bother doing this for most other conditions because there wasn't really such a significant difference between the two, but there were some notable differences here which I think it's important to focus in on. So the average initial time, looking at the static figure, has reduced from 7.94 to 4.7 milliseconds. That's really good and with VRR to 4.34 milliseconds. That's a significant improvement. But what's interesting is if you look at the overshoot, it's actually a bit more widespread using VRR. And in the game as well, I did see overshoot in places where I just really didn't see it at all at high refresh rates. You know, if you're sensitive to it, it could be a bit bothersome. You might prefer the weak setting. So yes, I'm loath to call this a single overdrive mode experience, a true single overdrive mode experience. Although, for some people, the medium setting would actually be just that and will work well throughout the range. So far, I have considered situations where the refresh rate is very stable. Yes, VRR is still doing its thing and it's still beneficial. And it gets rid of mismatches. But what happens if the frame rate is fluctuating a lot, as it may well be in-game, and actually in some instances in-game it will be, especially if you don't have a super powerful GPU? Well, there is something called VRR flickering to be aware of. VA models are particularly prone to that. OLED monitors also show it, and there's a little test which will cause extreme fluctuations in frame rate, which will show this off very readily. Now, it's not only shown here, you can certainly have in-game examples, they're just more difficult to show you in the video. So I'm just going to show you this test, you will see flickering, so if you're super sensitive to flickering and you find it bothersome in videos, just be aware of that. I put the monitor's refresh rate display, it's called a frame counter, at the top right, just so you can see the extreme fluctuations occurring with this test. You don't need such extreme fluctuations to see this flickering. You can see it also in in-game menus and some cutscenes you could see it, and just in scenes in games where there are fluctuations of maybe more than 20 frames a second or so can show it. But this test really does show it off in an obvious way, and it isn't just for the darkest shades. You might see it more for the dark or medium dark shades for OLEDs. VA models have more of a widespread flickering, so I can see it for the medium and even medium to bright shades quite readily as well. This isn't extreme flickering by VA standards though, so when I was playing games, even on scenes where there was quite a bit of fluctuation, or even if the LFC boundary was crossed, I wouldn't say the flickering was super obnoxious, but sensitivity to this varies. It's just that there have been some VA models I've used where the flickering, the VRR flickering is so bad that I have to disable VRR because I just can't tolerate it. Whereas this one, I was quite happy to actually just use VRR a lot of the time. Yes, there was some flickering in some scenes and in places, but it wasn't extreme and annoying and wasn't there all the time. So I found it okay, found it tolerable. Just a final thing to note, the monitor does not include a strobe backlight setting. It doesn't have MBR, motion blur reduction, as some AOC monitors do have. But in my experience, VA models like this, that kind of setting is usually a bit misplaced because the pixel responses can't really keep up with the strobing and it's usually quite a messy experience. So I, I can understand why they didn't bother with it with this one and also with it having a complex local dimming solution which is never something which you can use at the same time as a strobe backlight setting. It sort of is contrary to the main purpose of this monitor. 
To wrap up then, the monitor has good ergonomic flexibility. I'd say the build quality is decent enough for a budget offering. The contrast performance is a key strength. Recording over 4000 to 1 under my test settings, I was very pleased to see that. The screen surface, I think it's quite agreeable and it's actually less grainy than I usually see on QHD VA models. It's also a flat screen. I know some people don't like curved monitors for various reasons. And in my experience with VA monitors, curved ones, they tend to have worse uniformity. So that will be a factor for some people as well. The local dimming solution, though, that's really a key feature of this monitor. Um, 336 dimming zones, not a huge number, but combined with the native strong contrast of the VA panel and the local dimming algorithm, which I think AOC has actually done a very good job with, and the fact that you can adjust the brightness, I think that's actually quite usable under SDR, at least for games and movies, less so on the desktop, but that's not really an issue with this monitor itself, or specific to this monitor, it's something which I observe more broadly when I'm using local dimming solutions. But it's really under HDR where this local dimming solution came to life. The HDR on this monitor was really just a huge step above anything I've seen from a budget monitor before. It really was a dynamic and engaging HDR experience. In terms of colour reproduction, the generous gamut, good DCI-P3 coverage worked well under HDR and for SDR it gave a good level of vibrancy. The colour consistency, well there were some issues because it's a VA panel in terms of saturation being lost peripherally versus observing shades more centrally, but this wasn't extreme for a VA model. There's also some black crush and some sort of associated gamma shifts as well. Again, not extreme for a VA model. And when it came to responsiveness as well, I thought the monitor was pretty well balanced overall. It had a setting medium, which I felt worked pretty well throughout the VRR range. You could maybe consider weak for the lowest refresh rates if you're sensitive to overshoot. There's also a strong setting where the overshoot wasn't too extreme, at least for higher refresh rates. And that will have some utility for some people, particularly for competitive play. So as far as VA models go, I thought the responsiveness was actually quite decent. The pixel responses were, you know, pretty okay for a VA model. I had low input lag as well, which was nice, and support for 180 hertz, which is quite a good refresh rate to see from a budget offering. So overall, I really did think there was a lot to like about this monitor. When you consider its US pricing, under $300, Really, there's just nothing that comes close to it in terms of its HDR performance and just the all-round experience. But really, you do have to have HDR as one of your key focuses. You can certainly get monitors that are faster than this for less money. And I would recommend if you are really into competitive gaming, if you want to use your monitor for color critical work, then IPS alternatives are probably going to be a better bet. If you're really interested in HDR and an immersive experience there, then honestly, this monitor is a fantastic option for the budget. I appreciate as well that it is more expensive in some regions. This is just really based on US pricing, this assessment. It can become more difficult to recommend as the price creeps up in other regions. But even then, I'd still consider it for its own merits because there's nothing that's really directly comparable to this monitor. So for this reason, it is certainly a monitor I'm happy to recommend to people. So that's really all there is to the AOC Q27G3XMN. You'll find some complimentary content in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Be aware that liking the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, they are nice ways of showing your support.